I'm glad you clapped at the beginning because you won't be clapping at the end. <laughs> um, so, this has nothing to do with my presentation. It's only there because a prominent linguist told me all good presentations have lots of graphs, and mine only had lots of text. So I'll put this in there, <laughs> but that's not what I'm talking about at all. And unfortunately, as well as not having any graphs, it doesn't have any jokes, because when I did a trial run, it took two and a half hours when I kept the jokes in. So this is serious this year, and I really mean that. Okay. Anthony Lauder, that's me. And my accent sucks when I speak foreign languages. People always say, which part of England are you from? Whatever I say in any language. And to find out why this is, I decided to do some research, because I know nothing about languages, nothing about linguistics. I have to get more, all my ideas from other people. Yeah? So I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of academic papers on accents, and at least a dozen books. And most importantly of all, I did loads of Wikipedia and Google, my favorite resources. Okay? And this is what I learned. So anything that's wrong in here, these aren't my ideas. So language used to be a soft science. It was because you couldn't look into people's brains. You had to go based on external evidence. So all these softies, as I call them, linguists, psychologists, and philosophers, made very educated guesses based on what they saw on the outside. But nobody knew which guesses were correct. So they ended up with these camps arguing with each other, each certain that their perspective was correct, but no way of really knowing which really was correct. But recently, hard science has got involved because hard science has caught up. Now we can look into the brain. Now we can know what's going on. We don't have to rely so much on educated guesses. So now neurologists and statisticians and computer geeks and geneticists and so on are all jumping into what's going on in languages. And they've brought scientific evidence to many of the previous guesses to work out which of them may be true, which are probably true, and which are definitely not true. So the first thing we know is that most animals cannot talk, and some presenters can't touch it. <laughs> no, most animals cannot talk. They can only make these innate sounds like woof, woof, meow, meow, moo. I told you my accent was bad. <laughs> so uh, a few of them can learn some new sounds, like these ones here. Food, come, sit, naughty boy. This is the stuff I respond to, actually. <laughs> but they can't learn to say any new words. Although, people used to say only humans could. It's not true. A few animals can learn to talk. We've got mostly here uh, various kinds of birds, some sea mammals, and then a weird random bunch, mice, monkeys, apes, goats. I never knew that. Elephants, humans, and bats. So humans are in there somewhere. Yeah. And what do they have in common? These animals that can learn to talk learn by mimicking the members of their community, those around them. Yeah? In fact, amazingly, animals develop regional accents, just like humans do. Songbirds in different locations sing different songs with different tones, even. Uh, yeah. And when whales migrate, they pick up new accents, the accents of the whales in that new location. Or if they're dominant, the whales there cop all copy the accent from the dominant one that's just migrated there. And all of these animals have a cutoff period where if you have not learned to, to talk by a certain age, you'll never learn to talk, ever. And for many of the animals, it's just a few weeks or months, and really nasty scientists do cruel experiments such as taking newborn songbirds and sticking them in isolation, putting them back in the bird community at a few weeks old. And they cannot learn to sing for food. They cannot learn to sing to get rid of predators. They cannot learn to do mating songs, and they die. So language is a matter of survival for most animals, even for us, perhaps. Uh, for humans, this cut-off period is three years, approximately. And really cruel parents and weird kings have done experiments where they keep their, keep their kids isolated for several years. And when they've been rescued or released, no amount of therapy has ever taught these children to speak again. They just remain mute for the whole of their lives. What weird, cruel parents and kings they were. Anyway, for hundreds of years, people believed that little kids are like sponges. They soak up everything. Yeah? They learn languages easily. They can absorb anything. But adults, our brains 
are old and can't learn anything at all. They're like sieves. You pour stuff in and it falls out at the bottom. This is, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's true in my case. Anyway, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, though, it was the age of wishful thinking, and optimists didn't like that old story. So they started to say, no, all you need is to want it, and it'll happen. So they started to propose that the brain would be flexible for life, and they came up with some great buzzwords like neuroplasticity. You may hear that a lot. You'll hear it a few times from me today. And media and a few attention-seeking scientists went really crazy about this and said, age doesn't matter anymore, you, you just have to want it, you can do everything you want, you've got unlimited abilities. And it turned out, though, that neuroscientists spoiled the wishful thinking in the 1990s and showed that it is true for infants they have this complete neuroplasticity. If infants suffer traumatic injuries, they can still recover from them, the brain will remap itself. For adults, it's only in very limited contexts, only limited kinds of plasticity are true. And there's a reason for this that we'll see. So, in the 2000s, language researchers started to notice the idea that it's not that your brain is flexible and then stops being flexible, there are these multiple periods of plasticity, which we're going to come into, where it switches off, your brain switches off its interest in certain types of things. My brain's interested in jokes most of the time these days, not much else, but your brain switches on and off so that you are receptive to certain things and ignore other things at different stages so that you're not just swamped with signals. And what causes this to happen? Well, nobody knew for a very, very long time until the 1990s, and this was a very important event. There's a British-Pakistani family that it was discovered in the 1990s where a whole branch of the family had no capacity to learn to speak, just mute all the way down one line. And Pakist Pakistani Muslim families in the UK are really important for geneticists because they all marry their first cousins. And what that means is that even though they only represent 3% of the population in terms of births, they represent a third, a third, amazing, of genetic defects. So when the government wants big programs as the genetic de defects, they look at the Pakistani families. And they decided that this particular Pakistani family would teach us a lot about understanding language because they couldn't speak. So in 2001, Geneticists discovered the so-called language gene. I'll put quotes around this because it's a bit contentious. But the fancy name for this, here's a buzzword you can use, is foxhead box P2, or fox P2 for short. And all those animals, like bats and elephants and humans and songbirds and so on, have this gene. And that Pakistani family had a mutated version of this gene, a monogenetic problem. They had a mutated version of this, so they couldn't learn to speak. Yay! Now we know where speech comes from. And what FOXP2 does is it, go, it steers language learning through these various stages. And we'll come into what these stages are. But the fancy scientific term for this is modulated windows of plasticity. You can impress people. That's why I put it in there. You can impress people using that phrase. FOXP2 steers language through modulated windows of plasticity, where you are sensitive to certain kinds of input excluding all the others. Yeah? So you're immersed in just one kind of signal. And if you deviate from these stages, your language development is hampered. Actually, I was born three months premature. So I'm blind in one eye. And I've got all sorts of... It explains my many failings. But one of them is <laughs> I was a late language developer because I didn't go through these stages in the normal sequence. Yeah. Anyway, let's peek into some of these modulated windows of plasticity to see what happens. So a newborn baby, being a newborn is actually the worst thing to be because you've got complete sensory overload. Your brain is undifferentiated functionally. You're just swamped in signals. You just can't make sense of all the noise. Um, synesthesia has become a big buzzword these days. People think it's a positive thing, but actually for babies' brains, synesthesia means things like they taste colors and they um, hear the texture of something and so on. And it's not a good thing. They're overwhelmed by all these sounds. Yeah? So it is not a superpower. It is not a superpower. Don't think synesthesia is a good thing. It's, it, in fact, the early stages of what FOXP2 does are to help you overcome synesthesia so you can make sense of the world. The first two months, you are learning the music of languages. 
the shape. That's all you're looking for, and your brain is excluding everything else. It's just interested only in the shape of the language, of your mother language. Yeah? So noticing the general feel, and it's picking up this shape from amongst all the other sensations. By six months old, you no longer suffer from synesthesia. You're starting to make sense of the world. Woo! Um, and you notice phonemes, that the fancy word. Phonemes mean the valid sounds of your language. Each language has different valid sounds. And babies are now starting to understand that speech is something that comes out of the mouth and they're starting to babble. At six months old, you don't know where they're from. You can make recordings of babbling babies and not know where they're from. But that soon changes. Because by 10 months old, not only do we know the sounds of, the, of our own language, we can represent the valid variations in them, the slightly different variations that are permitted. And we're starting to speak the sounds of our language. So English people are obviously very selfish because we make all these smiley me kind of sounds. And Germans are obviously very outgoing and caring because they make these kissy you kind of sounds when they're babbling. So we're already at 10 months old. You know where somebody's from. Quite astonishing, I think. Um, so, by a year old, we understand that sounds have valid combinations, and in various languages, th they only have specific sound combinations. And already, this is the source of my problems. Already at one year old, we cannot hear sounds, well, many of you, we're starting to lose the ability to hear sounds that are not in our language. So Japanese babies, even at one year old, cannot distinguish between L and R because they are not phonemes, phonemes in Japanese. And apparently, I don't know if this is correct, but I read this, Greeks at one year old cannot differentiate between S and SH. If there are any Greeks here, did I just say the same letter twice? <laughs> so by two years old, they're aware about meanings, messages, that language is for conveying, me conveying messages, and they try to mimic sentences with all the clever combinations of sounds. Yeah? And they um, understand grammar. This is really important. Already at two years old, they know what the grammar of the language is. And if somebody makes a grammar mistake, their brain reacts in a very negative way. Brain scans have shown it's actually very jarring and an unpleasant experience for two-year-olds to hear grammar mistakes. Yeah. So two-year-olds will probably hate me, whatever language I speak in. <laughs> so, so three years old is this cut-off point. If you have not learned to speak your language by the time you're three, tough, you're never going to. And even if you get a lifetime of therapy, you're still not going to be able to do it. Yeah? By six years old, we are fluent speakers in our language. In that, that means that we speak our language well enough that it doesn't cause other native speakers pain. It's a seamless, easy conversation. Yeah? And you can recognize where somebody's from. You'll say, oh, that kid there is from Athens or something, because they've got the accent from that location. They've picked up the accent. Uh, and this is all when the age is six. That might be why kids start school at that age, because they can finally talk properly. But puberty, this is the really important stage. I think of puberty as being role reversal. We'll see what we mean by this. Puberty is when it becomes impossible to develop a native accent and can, and unless you're a, a very special kind of person. For most of us, it's impossible at past puberty to develop a native accent in another language. And the reason is that before puberty, we are learning. We are sponges. Yeah? So if I say something one way and somebody else says it another way, my brain thinks I've made the mistake and mimics them. Post-puberty, the brain thinks we are the teacher. And the other person, when they, make, when they say something differently, they're stupid idiots. They made the mistake. And there's a reason for this. And the reason is different for men and women. At puberty, girls can be mo become mothers. And when they're interacting with the baby, if they were sponges, the mother would end up going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you don't want to be learning baby talk. You've got to be the teacher. Yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? And boys, traditionally, at puberty, would be fighting the enemy tribes. And you need to identify very quickly who's friend, who's enemy. And if you're picking up the accent of the bad guys coming over the hill, somebody in your tribe might come and stab you. So it's a matter of survival, again. But by that adulthood, we've got this decline, which optimists will say we don't, but 
scientists say we do, where only a very, very few people, and we'll come into why, have this ability to get really good accents quite quickly by mimicking others. Use, they seem to put very little effort into it, and they just absorb accents. But the vast majority of us, we have to work really, 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 really hard using all these nasty things like the IPA and vocal tract diagrams and speech therapy for years and years and years, and the results are usually pretty rubbish. And there's a reason why the results are pretty rubbish. It's because these things actually originally came from, before cochlear implants existed, ways of teaching deaf people to speak, where you're relying primarily on tactical feedback of if they said the sound correctly. Where is my tongue meant to be? What shape should my lips be? Am I blocking the flow of air or not? This does not give you very accurate feedback on if you're making the sounds accurately, because you can't hear the sounds. Yeah. And progress is very slow. I found from the research that if you can't say S properly, it takes two years of intensive therapy. And for Japanese people, some Japanese businessmen want to be taken very seriously in business meetings. So they take lessons on differentiating L and R, and it's estimated to take eight years of therapy. In fact, in, this, in the, the war, I think it was the Second World War, Jap American soldiers were taught to ask the enemy to say Lollapalooza. And they were told, shoot on Ra. Yeah. Uh, so. Anyway, so the journey is painful for most of us, and we give up because we get very bad results. And the reason we get bad results is because talented brains don't work, work, dif they work differently from ordinary brains like mine. The reason is I'm, I'm just a regular guy. And talented brains respond when they're adults to foreign sounds in a very positive, pleasant way. So there's this part of the brain called the hippocampus for remembering novel things. When they hear novel sounds, it goes right in there. And the cerebral cortex is language region, processing it as language. Oh, those sounds are language. That's nice. But for regular brains like mine, it, it actually triggers two different bits of the brain. The cerebellum, which is the oldest part of the brain, a little brain beneath your big brain, and it's got a fear and flight region. Oh my god, the bad, bad guys are coming over the hill. Let's run. That's why it stimulates the cerebral cortex's motor region as well. These sounds make us scared. They certainly make me scared. I get really nervous when people are speaking foreign languages to me. And the reasons for this is, again, speak. your accent is necessary for your survival. Here you go. Tens of thousands of years of evolution mean that rival tribes, when they tried to attack and kill each other, had to have this very quick survival instinct. And strange sounds would make them run for the hills. And friendly sounds would make them group together. Now, how do we learn, then, what these friendly sounds are and what the nasty sounds are? Well, we don't spend our life studying textbooks and grammars for nice and friendly and nasty sounds at all. Instead, language learning is done statistically. Our brain is noticing loads and loads and loads of patterns in language from birth. Yeah? It's by immersing in the tribe and noticing the regularities in the language they speak. The brain is a big pattern creation machine. Yeah. And these deep patterns are what help us to survive. So kids, infants then, are not learning language facts. They aren't. They don't learn facts. They notice patterns in language, statistically. And newborn brains don't have any of these statistical patterns. So every sound is valid. That's why they are language sponges. There's no, no patterns of filtering out anything, because there aren't any patterns. And as you get exposed to the language through your life, through these modulated windows of plasticity, you're building up these statistical patterns of what's friendly and what's the bad guys. Who should I stab? Who should I join up with? So first we notice these basic sound patterns. So what are the valid patterns in our language? And amazing, this is, now this to me is absolutely amazing. The brain doesn't just have patterns of sound, it breaks the sounds down into their constituent bits. The pitch, the volume, the speed, the voice of the person, even where they are in terms of distance from you, and it has to, because otherwise you wouldn't recognize the same sound being made by two different people. Which sounds go together? This is the next stage, and you have to learn which sounds go together statistically in order for you, in order for you to be able to tell when one word ends and another word begins, because normally when we're speaking, we don't have any word boundaries or phrase boundaries unless we decide we need to stop to breathe. And we learn these boundaries by the brain noticing the irregular word sound combinations. They can't be part of a word, so they must be the boundaries. Then word patterns. 
which sounds combine to make words and which, what part is a word playing in a sentence. Is this a noun? Is this a verb? Is this an adjective? And so on. We don't learn these by knowing the words for noun and verb and adjective. We learn them by statistically sampling all the speech that's coming in. Yeah? Same here with morphology. This is not learned from grammar tables. It's far too sophisticated for grammar tables to capture it. We learn it by massive statistical analysis in our brains. And again, the word combinations and all their order, you'll see a great example of this, are derived statistically. So this matters because it means that we feel our language. We don't know it, we feel it emotionally. And this emotional feeling of language is essential. We don't have any explicit grammar rules. Well, we've learned a few at school, perhaps, but mostly we've learned how likely various things are by exposure. We've learned the relative probabilities of things to know what's most likely to come next. Yeah? And these then form our implicit, our internal feeling for what's right in the language, what sounds natural. And this statistical learning can really surprise us, as you're about to see. Did you expect that? No. What is that? I'll, I'll show you what it is. It covers rules that we aren't even aware we know. Nobody would probably know that we can describe these as 101 cuddly newborn fluffy black and white Dalmatian puppies, which they are. But it respects the implicit rules of adjective order. That's why it sounds good. But if you disrespect them and you say fluffy Dalmatian newborn black and white cuddly 101 puppies, it just sounds wrong. But you don't know why. Just implicitly, you've learned statistically this doesn't sound right because it's not a common order for these things. And this is really frustrating for foreign language learners. They, could, they say, oh, I don't know the answer to this. I'll go up to the native speaker and ask why. And the native speaker goes, I don't know. You just have to feel it. I hate that. I always ask the, I think I'll go to an expert native speaker and say, mm, mm, you just have to feel it. Well, I feel like kicking them, to be honest. <laughs> so, anyway, linguists tried to elicit some of these rules. And you can learn the explicit rules that they've elicited by heart and get them deep inside you, but it's got two really big problems. It's not done by statistical sampling over decades and decades, so you miss all the subtleties where you go, yeah, yeah, but in this case, that's not quite right. I just can't explain it. It's just the way it is. But more importantly, you end up with a mental checklist. You don't have this emotional feeling that natives have, so you can't feel the language in the same way. So. And these patterns are essential because when we speak normally, we speak far too quickly for people to be able to process it one little sound at a time. We've, you've got to process it at a, much faster process, at a much faster rate than the brain can possibly process sounds. And the way you were able to do that is because what you're actually doing is using these statistical patterns, knowing what's most likely to come next, to anticipate. And this anticipate, anticipation lets our brain think ahead of various possibilities in parallel Unfortunately, my brain is not very good at anything, so speak slowly when you talk to me. <laughs> but it, it means your, pro, your brain is still processing in parallel what you've just heard and recorrecting itself based on what's come next. Yeah. Uh, and, in, and it uses various regions of the brain to collaborate. It's, even though we think we're processing speech, we're actually looking at all kinds of stuff, what we're looking at, how persons are moving, what the temperature is, all kinds of different senses. Yeah. And these anticipations are updated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a second based on all these regions collaborating and backtracking and thinking previous anticipations were wrong. We've got to take a long path, a different path now based on our expectation. So, yeah, okay. This is, so here we go. We, we, our brain knows which is not whether something is right or wrong, but what's most likely. This is a big problem in language learning. We often are marked, yes, that's right, that's wrong. But your brain actually works in, that's less likely, that's more likely. And because of this, we can take the path of least surprise all the time. We're always anticipating what's likely to come next when somebody's speaking. And I'm going to give you an example of this, because we want to reduce backtracking. We want, to stop, we want our anticipation to be right, because then we can talk quickly and without surprise. So imagine a foreign speaker has not got much experience with English and has a terrible accent like I have in all my languages, and they say, I don't. Now, if they go, I don't, that's probably high probability, not surprising. If they say, I do not, 
Are they saying I don't not, or are they saying I don't with a funny accent? Your brain has to work hard. If they say I do not want, is he saying I do not want, or is he saying I want a donut and doesn't know word order? <laughs> if he says I do not want go, is he saying I want a donut, go and get me one, or I don't want to go somewhere? <laughs> I do not want go get donut. Jesus Christ, my brain's backtracking all the time to understand that one. I do want a donut, so, uh, okay. <laughs> so this, this kind of stuff, our brain's doing all the time. Yeah? So this is why accents actually matter. I always used to say, and a lot of people say it because it's nice to say it, accents don't matter. What, you really, what really matters is just communicating your message. And that's true for privileged people who are good English speakers because we're used to hearing lots of foreign accents. But for rarer languages that don't have many non-native speakers, they're not used to our weird accents. And we trigger their fight or flight instinct because our foreign sound is, to them, the enemy coming over the hill. And this isn't mental, this isn't a cerebellum. The li literally little brain. It, so your terrible accent, or my terrible accent, makes them feel bad. So, can adults become good at accents? That's the good question, isn't it? <laughs> well, we, I, a lot of people used to think no. It turns out neuroscience has found the answer is that it is possible. This really got me excited. <laughs> Whoa, is it possible for me? That's an even more difficult question. And what they found that there's a very simple technique that reawakens these aging brains that have petrified. I like this word petrified because it means your brain is solidified and it also means you're scared. So that it awakens these aging brains. And it opens up these statistical patterns to new sounds. So you don't have the fight or flight instinct anymore. You actually are open to absorbing them as relevant, friendly sounds. Makes old brains good at accents again. Mine was never good at accents. So old, my old brain good at accents for the first time. Uh, but you may already have guessed what this is. Because don't shout it out, please, though. But many societies have discovered this. It's been known for tens of thousands of years and is found across all cultures. They have turned to music and song. There are language courses that are based on music and song. Some of them are great, some of them are terrible. But I have learned why the great ones are great. And it's because music and song unlocks our language potential. And what's important is that now science actually knows why. And I'm going to come to this in a minute. I, don't, I never like things unless I know why. And now I know why. But we've always turned to song. Before, well, non-written languages, and through thousands of years, people used song to recite and remember the, the oral history and the stories and the religious scriptures of the language. And even today, kids at puberty in certain religions learn to recite the scripture, even in a foreign language to them. And they do this because they can reproduce the sounds, even though they're now at an age where those sounds are impossible. And since discovering this, neuroscientists have found that if you take a small infant just a few months old and play to them a wide variety of sound and mu music with songs in different languages, they actually babble in those sounds. They play with language more. They use a higher frequency range. They, they are literally practicing those accents, even when they're a few months old. And they start to absorb them as friendly sounds so that they'll have better receptivity to them in later life. This, they did this with four-month-old kids and found that even two years later, they still believed those sounds were friendly sounds. So... But nature compels us to sing to babies anyway. We don't speak to little babies and say, hello, I am your dad and I love you. You go, who's a cute little baby? Daddy Kins loves you. We do this singing thing automatically and it's called infant directed speech. And this again is found astonishingly across all cultures. And we don't even know we're doing it. It's a natural instinct to go up to a baby and say, oh, look at the cute little baby. We can't help it. Uh, and 
We're compelled to do it because infants respond really well to it. They turn to us, they smile, they giggle, they hold out, and, yee, yee, and it makes it an incredibly pleasant experience. And if you are speaking in infant directed speech, singy song language to a baby, and then you switch to adult speech, they'll immediately switch up and turn their head away. So they control you. One of my friends has a PhD in this, how babies, are, babies control the world. <laughs> we, we are their puppets. <laughs> but this highly pleasurable interaction is essential because it builds this in intense emotional bond and it cultivates what this is the fancy word I got from the literature hyper participatory collaboration. Yeah? And it's a big danger. We really, this is great stuff for language learning, but sometimes I've heard language teachers saying their students fall in love with them when they do these singy song kinds of things. Yeah, we fall in love. If anybody wants language lessons, I'm available. <laughs> Women only. Um, so, so, why does IDS work? Because it's got song-like properties. And let's look at some of these song-like properties. And one of them surprised me. It's not on this slide. These weren't surprising. The first thing is that it's got exaggeration. Yeah? So, um, oh, no, that's not the first thing. Damn it. I should have read the slide. <laughs> it's, so, we, we started with short, simple sentences and then build up. No surprise there. And it's got lots and lots of repetition. Amazingly, amazingly, we love songs the more we hear them. You can hear the same song a thousand times and like it more than you heard it the first time. But if you hear somebody giving the same speech, even one as great as mine a hundred times, you'll want to get out. And repetition is essential for language learning, and song makes us love repetition. Yeah, we crave it, we crave it. And, but hyper-articulation, hyper with careful speaking, is really what is essential for, being able to, for babies to be able to mimic us. Yeah? Because it helps them hear the sounds. And if we hyper-articulate foreign languages in song, we can better hear the sounds. We can... Yeah, and it works primarily by exaggerating, elongating the, the vowel sounds in the phonemes where you've got to be precise. But it also stirs up our emotions because you're playing with pitch and volume. And it's been shown that the more you play with emotion, the more babies like it and the more we react to things. So high pitch really loud things surprise and fit make us scared. But Low pitch, low volume things are quite soothing. <laughs> now, the opposite of hyper-articulation, this one surprised me, is hypo-articulation. This means shortening things, saying them quicker, shorter, less clear than normally. And we deliberately do this when we speak to babies, where there's a wide allophonic variation. That means when you, there are lots of different ways of saying the same sound, because you don't want to, them to have premature neurological commitment to the first few ways they hear it. So you want it to be ambiguous, so their brain will be receptive later on to different possibilities. And this, it turns out, is really, really hard to do deliberately. And when we are speaking to foreigners, we only hyper-articulate. We go, do you understand me? but we don't know where to be short. And we can't do it. It's very hard to do it in speech. Maybe some experts can. But amazingly, it's just amazing, when we do language, automatically we hyper-articulate where we should and hypo-articulate where we should. It's just incredible, really. So, does this singing stuff, though, work for adults? Well, neuroscientists didn't know. And now they've found out that it does. And they've found... Adults who used to be able to speak but had brain injuries and went through years of therapy, and after years and years of therapy, they still didn't learn to speak properly. And then they decided, let's do it with song and music. And the fancy term for this, so we got in the literature, isn't we sang to them. They said we used melodic intonation therapy. <laughs> and they learned to recover their speech ability in three months, many of these after years of having no success. And now, this is the great bit. Science actually knows how it works. I was amazed by this. It's so simple. It's really simple. Speech, for the most part, is in the left hemisphere. Of, is this the left? Yeah, the left hemisphere. Most part, left hemisphere of your brain. And the way when you reach puberty, what happens is, 
the right hemisphere dampens the left hemisphere so it's no longer receptive to new sounds. It tells the left hemisphere to respect these sound patterns that we've learned. Yeah? But, amazingly, neurologists have discovered if you keep the right hemisphere busy, it can't dampen the left hemisphere anymore. And music keeps the right hemisphere occupied. <laughs> so the left is unreceptive to new sound patterns in awaking the aging brains to new accents. I think that's just mind-boggling. So I was overjoyed with this because I'm absolutely useless at languages and at accents. So I thought, right, I'm going to do it. So I decided I would unlock my language potential and I put dozens of albums of music on my MP3 player and I went for a three-hour walk in... I, I live in the beautiful city of Prague. I went for a three-hour walk on a beautiful sunny day and I listened intently to the music, focused, 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 and I sang along the whole time, building up this amazing ability and I really was fully immersed, completely carried away by the whole experience. It really felt absolutely fantastic three hours, until I got home. And I looked at my MP3 player, and it was on single song repeat. <laughs> I'd been listening to just one song, endlessly for three hours, singing along, and I'd never even noticed. <laughs> and that is why my accent sucks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm afraid there's no time for questions. Thanks. <laughs> uh, it, it's terrific, and you've got some wonderful um, insights to all this. Could you make available the studies you are citing? When you say science says this, neuroscientists said that. Um, um, we'd we... love to see the, sci the references, if you can point us to where they are. Yeah, that's a great question, and I wish if I were an academic, I would have done it. But Otherwise... because I'm Mr. Lazy, I'm, I recommend you do the lazy approach that I did, which is type in a load of buzzwords, and then loads and loads of papers came up. And yeah, but you know, one has to understand. Because there was a question, you're mentioning cere the cerebellum as mm. the fight or flight, yeah. which ought to be the amygdala. Now, because m multiple parts of the brain have multiple functions, uh, interestingly, grammar seems to reside in the cerebellum, but I don't know if you can cite the study that also talks about yeah. what part well, of this yeah, is so, in the cerebellum. So I cannot. Yeah. Mine is an entertaining speech rather than an academic one. But if you can come up with those references, I'd be very happy. <laughs> okay. Can you hear? Wow. Oh. Maybe you can help a little bit, because uh, I, I grew up bilingual in Danish, and my mother was English. Now, the family moved to London when I was about five years old. And though I spoke Danish with all my friends perfectly, very quickly, I lost my Danish. Now, I live in Denmark, I've relearned the language, but I do not sound Danish to anybody in Denmark. Doesn't matter if I write you know, university speech or a paper, I don't sound Danish. What do I do? <laughs> well, I didn't hear what you just said. Huh? What did you just say? You didn't hear anything? I heard you when you said I don't sound Danish. Yes, okay. Uh, I lost my accent. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how do I... Do I just sing Danish songs now again and again? For three well, hours? Yes, but it didn't work for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll say help again. <laughs> so, yeah, try singing. That's what these guys say. Oh, sorry. Yeah, try singing. Maybe it'll work for you. It got me excited, so I was very disappointed when it didn't work. But scientifically, is it possible that I will never get it back? I'm no expert, but try it. <laughs> Th thanks for a very good uh, talk. So, oh. Could you tell something in English? Yeah, here, Martin. Sounded great to me. Tell it to dance. And tell it to dance.
I can't even... I, for, story by, for story by a seer. That sounds fantastic. Exactly. <laughs> Persis. Okay. Hello. Oh. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for this quite entertaining uh, presentation. And I appreciate you're not an expert, as we just said, but um, uh, my question was, uh, is it... Uh, do, do we require to sing along with the song necessarily, or do you just listen to the song in a different language and like get this accent? And uh, like, what's your view? Yeah. Oh. So, when it's little kids, sing to them, and they will babble along in time. They will because the purpose of this singing stuff is for you to mimic. You're basically so it's necessarily to also sing along it's with. Not, the... It's not just a passive thing. Yeah, you're meant to mimic along. My God, when I was singing all those, that, that one song over and over and over again, I felt very bad for the people nearby. I'm not, just as I'm really bad at languages, I'm really bad at singing. I had a recommendation for our Danish friend, and that is to talk to Professor Keeley, who was also at this conference, and he has done a lot of study on, on this. Uh, he, for example, says that it's also greatly a matter of uh, identity, of uh, how you perceive yourself uh, to, uh, to be. And uh, no matter how many exercises you do, your results will vary a lot based on uh, if you perceive yourself as, as Danish. You know, some language courses do this by giving people a, a different identity, a different name in, in the uh, target language in order to allow them to separate their current identity to the one that they're hoping to acquire. So that is also, I think, an, an important part of that. Well, thank you for an, a very, a very educational and very entertaining speech. Oh, <laughs> thank you. You made me feel good. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. It sounds like you've given us food for thought that we need to experiment with. And so I just wanted to offer an idea of maybe how you could experiment with some of these ideas. It sounds like uh, you need to find music that you really enjoy. You are really drawn to this music. When you listen to it, you, uh, f you feel pulled into it and you want to, you identify with this music. So your identity is, being, is becoming a little bit flexible and in the state of getting into the music, Maybe part of your conscious mind is turning off. Maybe this is the, the part about the right hemisphere dampening. Uh, stop being occupied with the music. And I think different people are, uh, different people can be hypnotized uh, with greater or less ease. And maybe this is somehow related to that. Ah. So if, you, if your right hemisphere is being occupied with the, by the music, then you are, your left hemisphere may be open to suggestion and maybe you could then combine that somehow with speech therapy where you're, you've practiced singing the song on your own and then with a speech therapist you simply work on improving the, the sounds you're making as you sing along. But it's, it would be important to uh, stay in this suggestible state of mind as you're doing this. These are just some ideas, but it sounds like this might be related to suggestibility. Well, in this, the, the thing about finding music you like is quite interesting because one of, I've read a lot of books here on music as well, working on this. What happens when you... There are books called things like Your Brain on Music, and I read loads of these. And the, I guess everybody knows that you end up liking a certain type of music that you heard when you were in your teens. And most people like what they call golden oldies. And what they actually mean are the songs from their teenage years. And it's a, we tend to find, a lot of us anyway, find modern music rubbish that these kids listen to who don't know any better. But we were doing this, we were listening to the rubbish of the day when we were teenagers. And I, I don't know why, I, I didn't find this in literature, why is it that we stop losing interest in new types of music when we're teenagers? Maybe it's because of this, we're now the teacher and not the student kind of phase in our lives. So maybe, yeah, maybe you just have to get the teenage golden oldies because those are the ones that you're most receptive to. I don't know. Uh, I had a little information about, I'm here. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, please uh, wave because it's difficult for me uh, to see. A little it. information yeah. about the song therapy um, because it is um, possible for the persons um, who suffers from aphasia uh -huh. after the stroke and it is possible to therapy them from the global aphasia to Broca aphasia. Yes. Um, only singing so you are not speaking with him you are um, singing exactly mm. yes a lot of the music and brain books talk about the, the, the music they just cure various problems in your brain yeah absolutely i think it's fascinating oh, incredibly enough this is how i learned foreign languages in the 70s without even knowing about this was with, with singing along with songs that i like but i think that you have to pick a singer who has the same voice type as you have. If you're a baritone, you need a baritone. If you're a tenor, you need a tenor. So that, and because the, what you're trying to do is not only match the, the, sound, what, the, the words that he's saying, but, but, all, but, but the pitch, you want to try to sound almost like him. Like, for example, James Taylor is in my voice range. And so I can sing along with James, sweet baby James, and try to sound exactly like him. Oh, oh. You know what I mean? And that yep. takes it, that's, that, that, fixes the accent right there. Yeah, in fact, that's a really, really interesting point. There's been a lot of research into the fact that when we're learning languages and we try to mimic our teachers, we pick up, we sh we, we pick up their frequency range. And because a higher percentage of teachers are women, men, when they're learning foreign languages, tend to have a higher accent than in their, a higher pitch. They, spe they speak like they're castrated compared to when they're speaking there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I've read somewhere Can you wave that. Your hand? Who is speaking? I am. Oh, okay. I was looking away. Yeah. Okay. I read somewhere that um, when people perceive your accent to be foreign or you perceive your accent to be different, that the highest percentage is the rhythm that you're speaking. That people who speak with perfect vowels and perfect consonants, if their rhythm is off, they sound really terrible. So one of the things that um, music therapy is very good for is getting the rhythm right. When I was teaching. English as a second language in the 80s and 90s, we had this uh, textbook in the United States called Jazz Chants, and we would like basically do common American speech, like, yeah, that's my thing, but you're, and we basically like sort of chant, you know, yeah. speech patterns, and a lot of my students who really sounded very awkward when they started speaking, when they started doing this jazz chanty kind of talking, they sounded a lot more American. They sounded a lot more local. Yeah, in fact, I, I said that the first modulated window of plasticity focuses on getting the musicality of your mother tongue, understanding the, the general rhythm and the musicality of it, whereas speech therapy tends to focus on isolated sounds. Vocal charts for making a single a single phone, the sounds are called phones, and not on the musicality. So we, yeah, the stuff that babies learn first is the stuff that we tend to learn either not at all or last with foreign languages. Hello, I'm Wave here. Wave your hands, who uh, is talking? Here. Oh, thank Hello. you, okay. Um, well, in my case, um, that actually worked a lot for me. I've never taken any German or Greek course and I actually learned Greek really fast because it's a very melodic language and, well, music helped me a lot to learn it and uh, I consider myself German to be not that melodic so it yeah. took me many years to acquire that language. So, um, in my case, I consider myself to be like very auditive but I've, I've realized that many people are not auditive at all so they learn more like from their more visual or whatever, an analytic. So would you recommend me to try this song therapy for those people or just like a phonetic course or something, something yeah. different? Well, I don't have any recommendations because I know nothing about languages. But the scientists recommend this route with music. They say it unlocks the potential. So all I say is try it and hope you have more success than I did. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you.